Well, as you know, last week we finished our verse-by-verse exposition of some selected psalms, and before beginning a new exposition of the book of Hebrews, I wanted to first spend the next four weeks looking at some text highlighting for us the greatness of God. And so tonight we're going to be looking specifically at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and the greatness of God and His majestic holiness. And so I want you to turn there with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. And here in Isaiah 6, really, we see one of the most elevated and exalted visions of God in all of sacred scripture. As we're brought into the very throne room of God and face to face with the very holiness of God himself. And couched in this awe-inspiring vision of God, we see the call and commission of Isaiah the prophet to go and to preach a message of judgment to rebellious Israel. And yet in the midst of that, God promises to preserve an elect remnant of grace to forever enjoy his messianic kingdom. And although most of us are probably very familiar with this passage, I don't think that we can ever have enough exposure to the greatness and grandeur of God. I don't think that we can ever have enough exposure to the terrifying majesty and traumatizing holiness of God. You see, one of the great dangers in our day is that God would become common and ordinary to us. That he would become diminished in our thinking and in our minds. Just like he had in ancient Israel when God came against his very own covenant people in Psalm 50 verse 21 with this charge. He said, you thought that I was one just like you. But I'm going to haul you into court and prove my case against you. What case? That I'm not like you. That I'm utterly other than you. I think we need to be reminded of that reality as well tonight. That there is an infinite distance and difference between us as temporal creatures and God as transcendent creator. And oh how prone we are to forget that. It's been well said that God created man in his image and ever since man has tried to return the favor by creating God in his own image. Let me ask you, how many times have you just casually waltzed into church on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening thinking little or nothing about the greatness and grandeur of God? Thinking little or nothing about the terrifying majesty and traumatizing holiness of God? Giving little careful contemplation to the character of God? Instead, perhaps consume with thoughts of yourself and your own greatness? or with what other people were thinking of you, and how they were perceiving you, where your mind was distracted and drifted and focused on lesser things, but not on God's greatness, not on God's holiness. And that can easily happen to us, can it? And so my prayer tonight is that our minds would be recalibrated by the word of God, and that we would truly see God's holiness our own sinfulness and the forgiving grace of God in Jesus Christ and the tremendous urgency to get the gospel to the lost and dying world all around us. In other words, that this vision of God's holiness would have the same life-altering impact and effect on us that it had on Isaiah so that we too would be truly useful to God in both life and ministry. And so follow along with me as I read Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 8. Starting in verse 1, Isaiah writes, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. 
Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And so here we see this incredible vision of Isaiah's life-altering encounter with God. As we look at Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8 tonight, we're going to see four progressive dimensions of Isaiah's life-altering encounter with God. First, we're going to see Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness in verses 1 through 4. Second, we're going to see Isaiah's condemnation of himself in verse 5. Third, we're going to see Isaiah's cleansing from sin in verses 6 through 7. And then fourth, we're going to see Isaiah's call and commission to preach in verse 8 and following. So let's look first at Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness in verses 1 through 4. As we look at this first main point, we're really going to see four sub-points under it, one for each of the first four verses. The first one of which is seen here in verse 1, namely the striking contrast. Notice Isaiah begins here in verse 1 by writing, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And so immediately we're struck with this contrast. King Uzziah is dead, but God is ever and always alive. Uzziah is no longer reigning, but God is ever and always reigning. The temporal king has perished, but the true and transcendent and eternal king remains. The throne of Judah is empty, but the throne of heaven is ever and always occupied. You see, folks, the the turnover rate in world leadership is 100%. Should the Lord tarry in a brief hundred years from now, this planet will be populated by 7 billion brand new people, and all 7 billion of us who are alive today will have perished and vanished off the earth and off of the stage of human history, just like Uzziah did here but not God. He always has been and he always will be alive. And so Isaiah is drawing our attention here to this striking contrast between Uzziah and God. You see, the fact that Isaiah's call takes place in the year that King Uzziah died is extremely significant. This isn't ancillary information here. And according to 2 Chronicles 26, Uzziah was one of the greatest kings who ever ruled over Judah. He was not like so many of the corrupt kings of the north. And he took the throne when he was just 16 years of age and reigned for an astonishing 52 years. Think of it, 52 years. In the past 52 years, the United States has witnessed the administration of almost 10 different presidents. And yet here in Judah, many people live their whole entire life under the reign of only this one king, King Uzziah. And fortunately for them, his was a reign of godliness that brought great prosperity to the people and great military strength and security to the nation. And as a result, he was greatly revered and greatly beloved, as you see in 2 Chronicles 26.15. But you see, as great as he was, Uzziah was still just a mere mortal and a sinful one at that. And as the Lord prospered him, he became puffed up and proud. And he essentially tried to play God, entering the temple to burn incense, something that was expressly forbidden by God and reserved only for the priests, Numbers 3.10. And so 80 priests gathered together trying to stop him, but he became all the more enraged, and so God struck him with leprosy, and it began to break out all over his face for everyone to see. And immediately the holiness of God struck the people as this great king who is so revered had been brought so low because of his sin of pride. 2 Chronicles 26-21 tells us that King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death and he lived in a separate house being a leper for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And so the great king who sat on the throne and dwelt in the palace ruling and reigning for so many years now dwelt in a leper's house until his death. And the message was crystal clear to everyone. God is holy and he will not tolerate unholiness. And I can only imagine that the priest that had to go into the temple next to burn incense must have been absolutely terrified. 
They must have been real quick to confess and repent and forsake their sins. I'm sure no priest or no prophet ever forgot this incident. I'm sure it was forever emblazoned upon their minds. God is holy. And so Isaiah says here in verse 1, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And so the king was dead, but when Isaiah entered the earthly temple looking for consolation during this time of national crisis, he was given a vision of the heavenly temple, and there he saw another king, the ultimate king, the true king, the one king who had forever sat upon the throne of Judah. He saw the Lord, Adonai in Hebrew, which means the sovereign one. And let me just say at this point that no one has ever seen God as he is in the fullness of his essence. One, because God is spirit. And two, because God is so blazingly holy that you would be absolutely incinerated by just one glance at him. Exodus 33.20, John 1.18, 1 Timothy 6.16. God dwells in unapproachable light which no man has seen or can see. And so anytime someone sees God in the Old Testament, they're seeing a refraction of his glory or a Christophany, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ, which is actually what we have here because John 12, 41 tells us that Isaiah saw Christ's glory and spoke of him here. And so Isaiah sees some manifestation of Christ's glory here, but interestingly, he doesn't describe Christ himself, but simply the things going around, on around him, his throne, his robe, his attendance, the shaking of the temple, the smoke, etc. And notice that he saw this universal sovereign sitting on a throne. In other words, he wasn't up there wringing his hands or frantically running around heaven trying to gain control of the universe. Now, he was calmly sitting, a symbol of his absolute sovereignty. And not only do we see his absolute sovereignty, but notice also his absolute separateness. He says that he saw the Lord lofty and exalted. This speaks of his transcendence, his utter otherness, his absolute separateness. And then finally here in verse 1, we see his absolute supremacy. Notice here at the end of verse 1, he says, with the train or the fringe or the skirt of his robe filling the temple. You see, in the ancient world, the regality and nobility of a king was often measured by the length of his robe. The longer the robe, the more noble the dignitary. And so if you were a Uzziah who had reigned for 52 years, you probably had a pretty long robe. You were another king, you might have had a short sports coat. As I was thinking about this, I thought back to my own wedding day and seeing my wife on the front of the platform there at the church with her long wedding gown, not only covering the front of the platform, but several steps behind her as well as going onto the floor down there. But what Isaiah sees here is absolutely staggering. You see, when he looks and sees the Lord, he doesn't say that the train of his robe filled the temple. But rather, the train of his robe was filling the temple, present active participle in the Hebrew text. Meaning that as far as his eye could see, the train of the Lord's robe was ever expanding. There was no end to it. It was infinite. You see, this was a king of incomparable splendor. There had never been a king like this before. Consequently, there was no room for anyone else to stand in this temple. And so here in verse 1, we see Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness, and it's highlighted by this striking contrast between the lowliness of Uzziah and the loftiness of God, between the mortality of the human king Uzziah and the immortality of the divine king God, between Uzziah, who is a temporal creature, and the Lord, who is the transcendent creator, between the Uzziah, who is unholy, and the Lord, who is utterly and absolutely holy. Between the temporal nature of Uzziah's reign and the eternal nature of God's reign. You see, from a human perspective, Uzziah occupied the throne of Israel for what seemed to be an absolute eternity, 52 years. While well, God has indeed occupied the throne of this universe for all eternity. He's absolutely sovereign, he's absolutely separate, and he's absolutely supreme. Well, not only do we see God's holiness through this striking contrast here in verse 1, but second, we see God's holiness through the subservient covering here in verse 2. 
The seraphim cover their eyes and feet in the presence of God's holiness. Notice here in verse 2, Isaiah writes, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his feet, and with two he covered, or two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now the word seraphim here literally in the Hebrew text means burning ones. These are angelic beings who are so close to God that something of the consuming fire of his nature is expressed in their very own character. And they ceaselessly serve as attendants around the throne of the Lord. And notice here in verse 2 that we have an anatomical description of these seraphim. Verse 2 says, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. So the first thing we notice here is that God has given these seraphim the necessary anatomy to function in their natural habitat, which is the immediate presence of the glory of God. And so notice first that he gives them two wings to cover their face. You may remember back in Exodus thirty-three eighteen 18, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, to show him his face. And what does God say? Exodus thirty-three twenty: you cannot see my face. Why? For no man can see me and live. And so God allowed Moses to be hidden in the cleft of the rock and to see uh, the, his hindquarters and a reflection of his glory as he went by. But he said, my face shall not be seen. To look upon my face is to die. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God dwells in unapproachable light which no man has seen or can see. And so no fallen human being can see God and live. To look upon God is to be incinerated by his blazing holiness. But you see the astonishing thing here in verse 2 is that we're not dealing with fallen sinful human beings. We're dealing with perfectly pure and sinless seraphim. And yet even they, in all of their burning brightness, must cover their faces in the presence of God's blazing glory and infinite, indescribable holiness. And so here in verse 2, we see the subservient covering as the seraphim used two of their wings to cover their eyes from God's holiness. And the question is, do we have that kind of reverence for God, or are we cavalier in God's presence just like Uzziah was? Well, notice also here in verse 2 that the seraphim are given two wings to cover their feet. This is an act of humility on their part and a token of their nothingness and their unworthiness in the presence of the Holy One. The question is, does God's holiness produce that kind of humility in us or do we have an inflated view of ourselves and our own significance? You see, the holiness of God ought to humble us to the dust, reminding us of the infinite distance and difference between us as tainted, transient creatures and God as the transcendent creator. Well, finally, notice here in verse 3 that the seraphim use their other two wings to fly. This is a sign of their readiness to be dispatched at a moment's notice to serve the Lord and to do His will. And again, the question is, does God's holiness produce in us that kind of eagerness to serve Him and to do His will no matter the cost? You see, the point here in verse 2 is that not even these perfectly pure and sinless seraphim can look upon the Lord, nor do they feel worthy even to leave their feet exposed in His presence. How much more ought we to shudder and quake in God's presence? We who cannot even endure the splendor of His angels. So we've seen God's holiness revealed first in the striking contrast in verse 1, second in the subservient covering in verse 2. We'll look thirdly now at the successive cry here in verse 3. Successive cry here, holy, 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 or perhaps other, 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 or separate, separate, separate. Notice verse 3, and one called out to another and said, holy, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, full of his kavod in Hebrew, his weightiness, the infinite beauty of his manifold perfections. And it provokes the seraphim to cry out as they think of the glory of God. Holy, 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 probably antiphonally, antiphonally back and forth to one another. Here we see the singing seraphim perfectly and perpetually praising God in heaven just as we ought to be doing here on earth. You see, God's holiness ought to engender worship in us, and not just with our lips, but with the totality of our lives. And our worship shouldn't be merely external to impress people, but internal and from the heart. 
And it shouldn't be in public only, but also in private when no one else but God is watching. God's holiness demands our worship. You say, well, what does it mean that God is holy? The Hebrew word for holy here, kadash, literally means to be separate. And when it's used to describe God, it has a twofold sense to it. First, it speaks of God's majestic holiness and the fact that he's transcendent and holy other than all that is not God, and thus he's separate from creation. He's unlike his creation and unlike any of the creatures within his creation. And then second, it speaks of God's moral holiness, not only his majestic holiness and the fact that he's separate from his creation, but God's moral holiness and the fact that he's morally perfect and pure and separate from all corruption and evil and sin. And so when we say that God is holy, we're speaking first of the majestic holiness of God, the fact that he's separate in the sense that he's transcendent, he's other, he's distinct from his creation, he's unlike anyone or anything. You see, when you try to describe the holiness of God, you're ultimately groping for language to try to describe the indescribable, to try to define the indefinable. Think about it for a minute. I've used this analogy before, but when you talk about an apple, what are you talking about? A type of fruit, right? You, you have a particular category you can put that in. When you talk about a BMW, what are you talking about? talking about a type of car. There's a particular category that that fits in. When you talk about a man, what are you talking about? A human being. There's a particular category to put that in. When you talk about God, there's no category to put him in. There's no class to put him in. He's in a class by himself. There is no other God. There's nothing else to compare him to, to liken him to. And so the holiness of God speaks of the utter otherness of God. For example, all else is creation. God alone creates. All else begins, God alone always was and always is. All else depends, God alone is self-existent and self-sufficient. And so when we speak of God's holiness, we speak first of his majestic holiness, his transcendent greatness, the fact that he's separate from all that is not God. Look at 1 Samuel 2.2. 2. You, you don't have to turn there. I'm just telling you, you can jot it down in your notes. But it talks about the fact there is none like our God. There is none holy like the Lord because he's the only God. Read Isaiah 40, verse 25. Who will you compare me to that I should be likened to him, says the Holy One. He's holy in the sense that he's separate from everyone and everything else. There's none like him. He's in a class by himself. He's the only God. There's an ontological distinction between God and everything else in this universe. Nothing else is deity. But then when we speak of the holiness of God, we speak not just of his majestic holiness and the fact that he's separate from creation, but we speak secondly of his moral holiness and the fact that he's separate from corruption and evil and sin. He's morally perfect and pure. In other words, God is not only transcendent in greatness, highlighting the creature-creator distinction, but he's also morally perfect and pure, highlighting the distinction between his purity and our impurity, his sinlessness and our sinfulness. In other words, he's separate in the sense that he's ethically distinct from sin and sinners. He's spotless in purity. Habakkuk 1.13 tells us that his eyes are too pure to look upon sin approvingly. We see an example of that in Leviticus 10 when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord and God instantly struck them dead for not regarding him as holy. See another example of that in 2 Samuel 6 when the Israelites were transporting the Ark of the Covenant and the ox cart stumbled. The Ark was about to fall into the mud, so here comes Uzzah to save the day, thinking he's going to do God a big favor, and he grabs the Ark. And what happens? Does God thank him? Does God commend him? No, God strikes him dead immediately. Why? Because he didn't follow proper protocol. He didn't regard God as holy. And one commentator points out that Uzzah wrongly assumed that his hand was less polluted than the mud that that ark was about to fall in. The commentator points out that when dirt and water mix, they make mud. They're simply obeying the laws of nature that their creator has established. But Uzzah had disobeyed the law of God. He was not to touch that ark. And so God's holiness speaks, one, of his transcendent greatness, and two, of his moral perfection and purity. Robert Raymond says, 
And so just as God the creator is transcendentally separate from men as creatures, so also he is ethically separate from them as sinners. Again, you have the majestic holiness of God in the sense that he's separate from creation in his being as God, and you have the moral holiness of God in the sense that he's separate from corruption and sin and evil. And so the stunning reality of who God is in all of his holiness provokes the seraphim to continually cry out, holy, 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 what we call the trice hagion, the three times holy. You ask, well, why three times holy? Well, some commentators have suggested that it's one for every person of the Trinity. I'm not so convinced. Instead, I think it's just like in English when we want to emphasize or stress the importance of something, we put it in bold or in italics or we underline it. Well, in Hebrew, when they wanted to stress or emphasize something, they did it through repetition. And so the angels are so awestruck by God that they can't simply say that he's holy, nor are they content to say, holy, holy. No, they must say it three times, holy, holy, holy. They take it to the third degree, the superlative degree. Only once in the entire Bible is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. You don't ever read that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. Those are all true. But you do read that he is holy, holy, holy. God is others, folks. He is other. He is not like us. Yes, we're made in the image of God, but he's separate and distinct from us as God. We are not God. Only God is God, and I think we forget that sometimes. And so we've seen God's holiness first in the striking contrast in verse 1, second in the subservient covering in verse 2, third in the successive cry in verse 3, and that leads us fourth now to the shaking columns in verse 4. Even the threshold shook at the voice of the angels proclaiming the holiness of God. Notice verse 4, and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. This is incredible. The mere declaration of God's holiness is enough to elicit an earthquake and the whole temple begins to shake and to fill with smoke. It's just like the theophany, the appearing of God in Exodus 19 and 20 when God came down on Mount Sinai to give the people the law and the mountain shook and was filled with smoke and the people trembled and said in Exodus 20 verse 19, you speak to us Moses and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. The people were absolutely terrified by God's holiness and the manifestation of his holiness and were visibly shaking in his presence. Folks, when the holiness of God comes in contact with the sinfulness of man, the only proper response is terror and dread on the part of sinful man. And here in Isaiah's vision, the columns of the temple begin to shake uncontrollably before God's holiness. Reminds me of a time when I was out in California during an earthquake. I was just a young kid. I was with my mom there at a golf tournament. We were staying in a hotel room when the floor began to shake. And the bureau began to shake. And all of a sudden, the lamp fell off the lamp stamp. I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know what was going on. It was a traumatic experience for me as a young boy. Completely unnerving. Well, I can only imagine that it was far more traumatizing for Isaiah, who was in the very presence of God himself. Notice in verse 4, the columns and the doorposts, the foundations of the threshold, began to shake and tremble at God's holiness. I'm sure Isaiah thought the roof was coming down on his head. And here in Isaiah's visions, the columns of the temple begin to shake uncontrollably before God's holiness. Speaking of this passage, one commentator said, if God's holiness doesn't turn you on, you don't have any switches. Because even the dumb, inanimate, impersonal structures of wood and stone had the good sense to be moved and to tremble and shake in the presence of the holiness of God. End quote. I love that. Inanimate objects have the good sense to shake and tremble in God's presence, how much more ought we as rational beings? And yet so often we're unmoved by the holiness of God. So often we come into God's presence in a cavalier, flippant manner. We ought to tremble at God's holiness. Now, of course, as genuine believers who have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, we do have acceptance with God and bold and confident access to God as our Father, but there's still a sense in which we don't ever stop trembling before the majesty of His holiness. 
And so we've seen the first progressive dimension of Isaiah's life-altering encounter with God, namely Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness in verses 1 through 4. We notice secondly now we see Isaiah's condemnation of himself in verse 5. Here we see the sinner crushed. Notice Isaiah's response to this confrontation with God's holiness. Verse 5, Then I said, Woe is me, for I'm ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, the foundation of the temple was not the only thing that was shaking before the presence of God's holiness here. Here in verse 5, we see that Isaiah himself was shaken to his very core. See, when Isaiah saw the living God and all of his brilliant, blazing holiness, he cried out, Woe is me! This is absolutely remarkable. You see, when the prophets announced the word of God to the people of God, the principal device they used was the oracle. And there were two kinds of oracles used by prophets, the oracle of weal or blessing and the oracle of woe or judgment. Now, it was one thing for a prophet to curse another person in the name of God, but it was another thing altogether for a prophet to call down that curse upon himself. And yet, that's exactly what Isaiah the prophet does here. Woe is me. In the other chapters, he's calling woe upon other people and other nations who have been disobedient to God. Here he's saying, woe is me. Calling down the curse of God, the utter anathema of judgment and doom upon his very own head. And immediately following this curse of doom upon himself, Isaiah cries out, I'm ruined. Literally, I'm destroyed. The ESV says, I'm lost. The New King James says, I'm undone. I personally prefer that word undone because as R.C. Sproul tells us, Isaiah was a man who was regarded as the paragon of virtue in Jerusalem. He was thought to be the model of integrity. And to have integrity, the dictionary tells us, is to be uncompromising with respect to principle. To be someone who's integrated, whole, it speaks of oneness, completeness, someone who has it together. And yet the experience of Isaiah, when he catches one glimpse of the elevated holiness of God, is the experience of disintegration, unraveling, coming apart at the seams. It's like dropping a bottle on the floor and watching the pieces shatter everywhere. That's what he's saying here. I'm disintegrating. I'm going to pieces. I'm utterly ruined. And in the next clause of verse 5, he gives us the reason for his ruin. Notice he says, because I'm a man of unclean lips. That's strange. We might have expected him to say, I'm a man of unclean thoughts or unclean desires or unclean actions. But instead, he immediately called attention to his mouth. He essentially said, I have a dirty mouth, an unclean mouth. And so the question is, why this focus upon his mouth? I think the answer is threefold. First, as a prophet, his mouth was used to speak for God. In other words, that's where he was most gifted and most useful to God. So he's essentially saying, even the very best of me is wretched. See, here's a man who's come to grips with the reality of his sin, and he knows that he deserves to be damned. He knows that the only just response of God at this point is to condemn him for his sinfulness and his uncleanness. Second, I think he designates his unholiness as the uncleanness of his lips here because he found himself in the midst of a choir of angelic angels who perfectly and perpetually praised God with pure lips while he had profaned God with his polluted lips. The seraphim used their lips to sing to God. Isaiah had used his lips to sin against God. See, Isaiah had become painfully aware that his mouth had not been an instrument of praising the holiness of God perfectly and perpetually like the angels, but rather his mouth had been a channel for pouring out the filth of his own heart at times. You see, the mouth is the place where we get in touch of our depravity, isn't it? Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. What you say is just a reflection of what's going on in your heart and the sinfulness of your heart. As we listen to ourselves gossip about others so that we can feel important and tear others down with our tongues so that we can build ourselves up and as we slander others and criticize others to feel better about ourselves and as we lie and exaggerate and embellish the truth, we realize just how deceitful we are and just how pervasive our sin really is. And third, I think he had King Uzziah, the leper, in his mind here. 
See, according to the Old Testament law, not only did lepers have to dwell outside of the camp, but according to Leviticus 13.45, any time they came in contact with others, they had to put their hands over their mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. And after being confronted with the holiness of God, Isaiah realized that he was no different than Uzziah the leper. He realized that he too was a man of unclean lips. He too was a guilty sinner deserving of God's judgment. And not only did Isaiah recognize the pollution within him, he also recognized the pollution all around him. Notice what he goes on to say here in verse 5, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, he recognized that he was not alone in his dilemma with sin. He understood that the whole nation was infected with dirty mouths, with polluted hearts. As Paul will later say in Romans 3.11, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who does good. There's none who understands. Now, if a man came into the church today condemning himself like that, we'd say, oh, don't be so hard on yourself. You're going to have a bad, self, bad self-image and low self-esteem. You're going to feel psychologically inferior. Stop being so negative. You're not that bad a guy. But you see, Isaiah knew that he was depraved, that he was a wretched sinner. And the reason he knew that is because he was not comparing himself with other people around him, but with God. Notice he says here at the end of verse 5, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Literally, the Hebrew text reads, the king, Yahweh of hosts, my eyes have seen. The emphasis is on the king whom he's seen. Now, what's interesting here is the contrast between the seraphim and Isaiah. You see, the seraphim are sinless and have perfectly pure lips, and yet they cover their eyes from the blazing holiness of God. Isaiah, on the other hand, is sinful and has polluted lips, and yet his eyes are uncovered. You see the contrast? The angels are covering their eyes, protecting themselves from the blazing glory of God's holiness. And there's Isaiah saying, I'm undone. I have no such protection. I can't put wings over my eyes. My eyes have just seen the king and I'm ruined. You see, this is what happens when an unholy man comes in contact with the holy God. The unholy man condemns himself, is filled with a sense of his own unworthiness, his own sin, and he realizes that the only just thing for God to do is to ruin him right there. You ever had that sense of awe before God, that sense of undoneness before God? If not, it's probably because you're always comparing yourself to other people. Sizing yourself up against their holiness rather than God's. Always finding other people that you're doing a little better than, just like the Pharisee with the publican in Luke 18. Thank God I'm not like other men. John Calvin says, quote, As long as our gaze is fixed on this world, on the horizontal plane of this earth, we have no problem with our self-images. We flatter ourselves and address ourselves as something only less than demigods. Until if for one second we lift our gaze to heaven and contemplate what kind of being God is. In that second, that former security and smugness is annihilated. He said, this is the uniform testimony of holy men in the Old Testament who were reduced to trembling with but one glimpse of the character of God, end quote. See, as long as Isaiah could compare himself to other mortals, he was able to sustain a lofty opinion of his own character. But the instant he measured himself with the ultimate standard God and his blazing holiness, he was absolutely ruined, absolutely undone. R.C. Sproul, in his excellent book, The Holiness of God, describes Isaiah at this point like this. He says, Isaiah was groveling on the floor. Every nerve fiber in his body was trembling. He was looking for a place to hide, praying that somehow the earth would cover him or the roof of the temple would fall upon him. Anything to get him out from under the holy gaze of God. But there was nowhere to hide. He was naked and alone before God. Unlike Adam, Isaiah had no Eve to comfort him, no fig leaves to conceal him. His was pure moral anguish, the kind, of rips, the kind that rips out the heart of a man and tears his soul to pieces. Guilt, 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 relentless guilt screamed from his every pore, end quote. Let me ask you, you ever been there before? You ever truly been confronted with God's holiness and your own sinfulness and the fact that there was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide? 
to the point where you were undone in God's presence, aware that you were only a hair's breadth away from your own eternal condemnation, crying out to God to be merciful to you, the sinner. Well, that's where Isaiah was here. And not only do we see Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness in verses 1 through 4 and Isaiah's condemnation of himself in verse 5, but notice thirdly now Isaiah's cleansing from sin in verses 6 through 7. Here we see the sinner cleansed. Notice starting in verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Well, thankfully, the God of glory is also a God of grace. The holy God is also a forgiving God. The infinite God is also an intimate God. And he doesn't just leave Isaiah groveling in his guilt. This is incredible because Isaiah experiences a grace here that's probably just as remarkable as the glory of God that he had just seen. Isaiah was in a helpless, hopeless predicament. He was condemned before an infinitely holy and inflexibly just God. There was nothing he could do to cleanse himself. There was no amount of good works he could do, no amount of church going or Bible reading he could do, no amount of money he could give, no ritual he could perform, no baptism he could undergo, no penance he could do, no magic prayer he could pray. His only hope was that God would send an intermediary. And that's exactly what God did. God graciously responded to the broken, contrite, self-condemning prophet by providing atonement and forgiveness for his sin. Notice in verse 6, God has one of the seraphim fly to Isaiah, and in his hands, the seraphim carries a set of tongs, and pinched between the teeth of the tongs is a scorching hot coal from the altar, which he takes and presses against Isaiah's lips. Ouch! Don't try that at your next barbecue. Can you imagine the pain as his lips are cauterized by this scorching hot coal? Don't ever talk to Isaiah about cheap grace. He knew that there was something intensely painful about true repentance. But notice at the end of verse 7, these incredible words. The seraphim says, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Expiation, the removal of sin, and your sin is forgiven. Propitiation, the wrath of God has been satisfied. Now let me just say at this point that it wasn't ultimately the burning coal or Isaiah's pain that took away his sins. You see, the purging of his lips with the burning coal here is only a symbolic act of forgiveness and cleansing. It's not Isaiah's pain that makes him forgiven. It's only Christ's pain that brings forgiveness of sin. You see, the forgiveness here in verse 7 is tied to the altar in verse 6. And the altar that's mentioned in verse 6 is the altar of sacrifice that was in the temple. It was here at the altar that the animal sacrifice would be burned. You see, in order for God to forgive sin, an innocent life needed to die in the place of a guilty life. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so an unblemished sacrifice would be slain in the place of the guilty sinner so that the guilty sinner wouldn't have to be slain. And when that animal was slain, the body of the sacrificial animal was placed upon the altar where the fire of the burning coals would consume the animal's sacrifice. And it was from that very altar that the seraphim took the coal to cleanse Isaiah's lips. And notice what the seraphim says at the end of verse 7. Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Literally, your iniquity has been turned aside or expiated or removed, and your sin has been atoned for, propitiated, kephar in Hebrew. It means to atone for by offering a substitute. You know that word kafar, don't you? Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. You see, what you have here is the same thing that you see in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement when the two goats were taken to the tabernacle. One goat was slaughtered in the place of the guilty sinner to propitiate God's wrath, and then they would lay their hands on the head of the other goat called the scapegoat. They would confess their sins on him, symbolically transferring their sins onto that goat, and they would release that goat into the wilderness, symbolizing the expiation or removal of sin. 
And so here Isaiah stands in the throne room of heaven in absolute despair because of his own sin, and God, in his incredible mercy, sends forth an intermediary to come to take that hot coal from that burning altar, that symbol of death, of propitiation, of appeased wrath, and he touches his lips and he says, your iniquity has been taken away and your sin has been atoned for. And yet Hebrews 10.4 tells us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. See, these animal sacrifices that took place at the altar in the Old Testament were a type that ultimately pointed to the greater once-for-all sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the spotless, innocent Lamb of God, slain in the place of guilty sinners so that they wouldn't have to be condemned for all eternity. The suffering servant that Isaiah would later talk about in Isaiah 53, who was crushed for our iniquities. And so Isaiah is forgiven here because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ ultimately. His substitute sin bearer and the one who would be his substitute righteousness provider. Now, can you imagine the overwhelming sense of relief that must have flooded the heart of Isaiah at this point? A hair's breadth away from his own eternal condemnation. He sees God. He knows in turn that he must die because he's a sinful man who's offended this holy God, who's broken the law of this holy God. But in an astonishing act of grace, God makes a provision of atonement and purges away his sin. Isaiah must have been an absolute shock, absolutely overwhelmed with a sense of unspeakable joy and gratitude at that moment. I mean, imagine it this way. Imagine being guilty of a crime where you're given the death penalty. And so they strap you into the electric chair. They crank up the voltage. They begin counting down the last few seconds of your life. Five, four, three, two, one. You're about to be electrocuted to death. But when they get to zero, you don't feel any voltage shocking you. You open your eyes and the warden says, go. You're forgiven of what you've done. You can go free. An innocent man has offered to take your place in that electric chair. Can you imagine the feeling? That's what Isaiah is feeling here, magnified a billionfold. He's expecting judgment, eternal damnation for his sin against this holy God. But instead, he finds forgiveness through a substitute taking his place, ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Isaiah is now cleansed and qualified to proclaim the only message of hope to the world, the forgiving grace of God in Jesus Christ. And so we've seen Isaiah's confrontation with God's holiness in verses 1 through 4, Isaiah's condemnation of himself in verse 5, Isaiah's cleansing from sin in verses 6 and 7, and finally now in verse 8 we see Isaiah's call and commission to preach. Here we see the sinner commission. Notice verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am. Here am I, send me. And so for the first time, the seraphim are silent, and Isaiah now hears the voice of God himself as one member of the Trinity says to another, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the fresh realization of what God has just done for him, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Isaiah's gone from woe is me in verse 5 to here I am, send me, here in verse 8. And that ought to be our response tonight as well. See, no one stands before the judge of all the earth guilty of high treason in the cosmic court of heaven feeling truly lost and desperate and helpless, threatened by an eternity of conscious torment in hell and hears the gavel slammed down, counted righteous in Christ, not just forgiven, but eternally righteous because of Christ and walks away unaffected and unmoved and indifferent or even worse, prideful and arrogant, strutting around as though they deserved God's mercy. Now they're humbled to the dust and overcome with gratitude. And as a result, they live every second of their lives to worship God and to witness to others. The reflexive response of the truly forgiven sinner is always worship to God and witness to others. The truly forgiven sinner is absolutely overwhelmed by forgiveness. And as a result, they can't stop talking about it. They want to tell other sinners about it so that they too can benefit from what's happened to them. Let me ask you, does that describe you tonight? Are you passionate about getting the gospel to others around you? Are you burdened for lost souls? Or have you confused being the elect of God with being the elite of God? 
or you've been withdrawn and isolated and indifferent or perhaps pridefully looking down on other sinners, thanking God that you're not as bad as them, forgetting that it was grace alone that saved you. See, there's nothing more contradictory than a person who claims to have been forgiven of their sin and yet at the same time has no desire and no passion for others to share that same forgiveness and to worship that same great God that's forgiven them. A truly transformed heart always evidences itself in witness. If there's no witness, one wonders if the heart's truly been transformed. Listen, God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for purified people. And that's what he had here in Isaiah. One who is purified and now qualified to go and proclaim this message of hope to the world. God's looking for people who, like Isaiah, have been confronted with his holiness, verses 1 through 4 who have condemned themselves for their own sinfulness, verse 5, who in turn have cried out for mercy and been forgiven of their sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, verses 6 through 7. Listen, folks, we have the unspeakable privilege of telling others that the holy God is also a forgiving God, that the infinite God is also the intimate and immanent God in Jesus Christ, that the lofty God serves to stoop lowly man in the gospel. So may we look to Christ tonight as both our example and our empowerment. First as our example, as the one who left his throne in glory to come to this earth as the seeking savior to go into the far country to call prodigals like us out of our pigsty of sin. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And second, as our empowerment. I take this message of God's holiness and man's sinfulness and God's forgiving grace in Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world around us. Knowing that as verses 9 through 13 go on to tell us, we don't have time to look at them tonight, but most will reject this message. Most will be hardened by the gospel as it goes out. But God will, as you read those verses, through our preaching and the, the preaching of God's faithful people, call out an elect remnant of grace for himself. So may we go. What a staggering privilege we have to proclaim the message of God's holiness and man's sinfulness and God's forgiving grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. May that be the passion of our hearts and the priority of our lives. Let's pray. Father, we're amazed as we meditate upon this passage. Again, we're trafficking in transcendent truth trying to understand a God like you who's separate and other we don't have any categories to compare you to anything else, so you are beyond us. And we're finite and we're fallen and we struggle to understand you, but we're thankful that you've revealed yourself to us very clearly in your word. And I pray that the only appropriate response to your holiness would be a constant and continual humility, a constant and continual confession of sin and repentance of sin, constant and continual looking to Christ to forgive us of our sin and to empower us to live as we ought, and a constant desire to proclaim the gospel to those around us. I pray that we would not be indifferent to your holiness, but radically transformed by it, just like we see here with Isaiah. I pray that if there's any who are not saved, who have never come face to face with your holiness and their own sinfulness, have never been ruined and undone in their sin, that this perhaps would be the night that they would realize that they are justly condemned before a holy God who must punish sin, who will not acquit the guilty unless they repent of their sin and trust Christ to take their punishment for them. I pray that perhaps even one here who's not saved, would repent and embrace Christ to take that punishment, to provide his perfection, and to indwell them and empower them to live the life that you've called and commanded them to live. We ask it now in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.